Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to my YouTube channel, The History Squad. Now what uh, today's video is about is um, how they survived arrow wounds in the medieval times. So we're going to dive into a little bit of medieval surgery, have a look at the different arrowheads, the wounds they caused, and how they actually got those arrows out and treated the wounds. Now, some parts of this are going to be quite graphic, so if you have a bit of a squeamish tummy, we'll give you a warning so you can look away. But for now, let's get stuck in. So when it comes to arrow removal, we're looking at thousands of years of history, aren't we? The Romans, the Persians, going all the way back. In the Americas, you've got your First Nations. I mean, this is a, a First Nations arrow, an arrowhead made by a friend of mine from the Cheyenne down in the United States. It's a Flintstone arrowhead. This would, oh my goodness me. But they had their own ways of removing them. And we're going to look at the medieval side of uh, arrowhead removal. But there was a problem with the Europeans, the church. The church had suppressed surgery, something to do with dealing in blood. Uh, but the Muslims, they continued to discover to work. Two instances I read about in the Crusades where two Muslim soldiers had been wounded. One had had his eyelid virtually severed, but the surgeons were so skilled, they stitched it back on. And when it healed, it worked. To me, that's wow. Another one had a large piece of his face sliced so it was hanging down. And they were able to repair it, stitch it all back together again, and hardly leave a scar. And it's quite incredible when you look at this crusade when uh, Richard the Lionheart landed. He was ill. He got typhus, I understand. Saladin, Salahuddin, one of my heroes, by the way, sent his surgeons and doctors over to treat him successfully. And yet when he was wounded with a crossbow bolt through the shoulder later on in France, they managed to pull the crossbow bolt out, but he died from the infection because it was mishandled. But today I'm going to focus mainly on medieval times when it comes to the, the arrowhead removal. You look at the Battle of Poitiers, uh, Geoffrey Le Baker, he was a British, uh, sorry, an English chronicler. He talks about how even during the battle itself, men who had gone down, who had been wounded, were dragged away from the fighting, placed under hedges, thorn bushes, that kind of thing, for protection. So it's not a case, you know, in the films you see these terrible malaise of people being smashed and just left to die in the mud. That's not quite true. And if you look at uh, Frossart, I know he was looking back uh, using witness accounts at the Battle of Cressy, for instance, how the arrows came into the enemy like a snowstorm. And then the enemy from the other side talking about how the arrows shredded the uh, horses, barbed arrows. It must have been horrendous for them. And I'm going to cover horses in medieval warfare in a, in a later film. And there's the one where soldiers have been through the arrow storm and they got so many arrows in their bodies, they resembled hedgehogs. So it must have been horrendous. So the first things, first things first is the, the bodkin arrowheads. This is quite a heavy bodkin. It's a nasty piece of work because it can smash its way through the padding and through the um, chain mail. Dent armour, if you'd seen me having a go at that knight's helmet, you can understand what uh, bodkins can do. But I've got uh, the Type 14 bodkin, quite heavy. Wars of the Roses fame, if I understand. And I've got two really ancient uh, bodkin types, a long bodkin and a fluted bodkin. These are very early medieval or, or late Viking, if you like. And stuck in the skull here, which is gonna, I'm going to use in a little while, we have a short bodkin. Now, my experience with this, this is a really good arrowhead, one of Hector Cole's, uh, tempered. This really does make a mess of, of everything except the best plate armour. It's a tiny little thing. But then, you have a long bodkin, once again one of Hector's. The problem with the long bodkin is if it hits bone, it will snap at the end and leave a piece in. So there you have a series of bodkins from the different arrows or different arrow heads. But I'm going to show you this now, which kind of floors you a little bit. A crossbow bolt. 
This one has a heavy cross-sectioned head and it just causes absolute havoc when it hits you. This is uh, reflected, of course, in Richard the Lionheart's death. Now, those are bodkins. How about that for a broadhead? So if your horse is hit with that, it's just going to be absolute agony. If you're hit with it, it's going to be agony. But there's a Type 16 where the edges, the flanges here, the hooks, are actually swept right the way back. So this will really penetrate. And what I've found in the past doing the old films on pigs and whatnot, they won't let me use people, is this actually turns as it goes to the body. So try to get it out with those um, hooks here, these barbs, it's quite messy. So there you are, minding your own business on a battlefield and somebody like me shoots you with an arrow. Ouch. It's not been cleaned. It may have even been in the dirt. So it could have animal feces on it. Your friends see you go down, it's a shallow wound. So they pull the arrow out, it's come out complete. Excellent. So they bandage you. Not with a nice clean bandage like this. This is for the films. They will rip a piece of cloth off your clothing. It could be covered in mud, blood, even have splashings of horse manure on it. They will bandage you as tight as they can to stop the bleeding. But now it's down to the doctors, the surgeons, who are going to fight the infection for you. Now we do know Henry V stockpiled uh, verdigris and sal armignac. Uh, verdigris, copper based, helps with the healing, I understand, and the armignac can clean the wound. But then you have honey, and we know that Castle stockpiled honey, not just for food, but they had a separate store of medicinal honey. And of course, honey is used today in hospitals to fight infections. So lots and lots of effort put into armies on campaign, having surgeons and doctors who could fight the infection. There is this one piece about before you put the honey in, make sure the wound is clean. If the wound is infected, then you've got to clean it first. Then you put the honey in, which will then help to heal the wound. And of course, Henry V, he learned the hard way, didn't he? With the arrow wound in his face. But it was the honey that helped heal the wound. Some say that the honey gave you less of a scar, but others say it, it, it made no difference to the scarring. The idea is to heal that wound from the inside out. Now, I learned this in the army. If somebody sticks a knife in you, you have a puncture wound. If a dog bites you, for instance, don't close the wound up. You've got to keep it open. You've got to widen that wound, let the infection out kind of thing. And the way they used to do it, they had wooden dowels with linen wrapped around it. And this was dipped in, get your head around this, turpentine, which is uh, distilled from pine resin, I understand. And they would push this into the wound to keep it open, right? And there were poultices as well that were used to keep the wounds moist. So they really did kind of know what they were doing when it comes to infection. The one thing they didn't know is what was bacteria. So before we do our demonstrations, I'll just introduce you to a few of the tools that they used to pull the arrowheads out or push them all the way through from a person's body. You, of course, you've got various knives and scissors and these lovely hooks. Just look at those, uh, delightful for opening the wound. My favorite, of course, will be the one I used 15 years ago in uh, my arrowhead removal from Henry V. He was wounded in 1403 at the Battle of Shrewsbury. John Bradmore, the surgeon, he designed this. It's a metal spike, screw thread and a handle, insert it into the tube, screw it forward, the tube opens, and the idea is, as you push it all the way through, the arrow, it actually opens here, which grips the arrowhead from inside. Now this is a socketed arrow. So we know that exactly what, what it is, the arrowhead is stuck in the bone. They know the shape, they've either been inside and had a, a feel, or they know because of the 
arrow shaft that they removed. They know what kind it is. So you insert that in, tighten it as tight as you can, and then you, well, in fact, I can't pull it off. So that's enough so that you can pull that, twist it and turn it. Quite incredible. But before this, there were other ideas. First of all, if you have a socketed arrowhead, you need the corresponding shape to push it through the body if you can. If you can't push it through the body, you've got to rely on forceps, pliers, things like this. And one little thing I've rigged up, it's not the exact, but it's close, is when you put the forceps in and then loop a piece of cord over. Hold it fast, tighten the cord, then slip in the forceps, and together with the cord and pressure on the forceps, you can twist it out yourself. It's gonna hurt, isn't it? I, I think I prefer John Bradmore's uh, way of doing things. But if you've got uh, an arrowhead that is tanged, has a spike that fits it into the arrow, you've got to get a corresponding tool that will fit over it so that you could push it in or slide down the twine to then try and pull it out as one. Also, there can be a problem when you have an arrow that's in the body and the shaft has broken off within the body. A simple screw device that you push in and screw into the arrow itself. This is gonna be agony, but it's ways of getting purchase to either push or pull the arrow out. And uh, one of the nasties, of course, is this Type 16, those barbs. You can put the twine around to give you a bit of purchase. So you've got the twine around there. Then, how about this? They slide the quills of feathers down over the barbs so that when they extract the arrow, it won't tear through all of the meat. Yeah, I think Todd's workshop did a nice meat shot, ruined the Sunday joint, but it was a good shot. Uh, I'm gonna have a go on some of my false arms and we'll see how we do. This is painful stuff. And people say to me, oh, how on earth could they do it? Well, I actually got hurt through the corner of my eye and had to have stuff removed in the field, in the army. And what the medic says to me, just take the pain, son. You do. Last thing. Here we have some forceps. These are to pull an arrow clean through the bone. We'll have a look at that in a moment. So, first of our demonstrations. Barbed arrow, been shot through the back of the wrist and they can feel it just on the other side. They can actually feel the arrowhead. So, they're gonna cut through then they're gonna push from the other side. And you can see the arrowhead, force it all the way through, job done. Now what they have is an open puncture wound. So then they start with the honey and whatnot. But if this has gone against the bone and they can't get it through, they've got to pull it out. And of course, you're gonna have that terrible turning. So once again, gonna open the wound Pull the skin back so we can see what we're doing. And then hopefully, try and feel for the barbs. Put one feather on. Put another one on. Hold tightly and very, very gently try and pull the arrowhead out without tearing and uh, ripping the wound even further. Of course, you're gonna have some infection in there because of the feathers, aren't you? So, unhook him, and we'll move on to the next one. So, it's one thing if the arrow has gone in to the flesh, you can push it through, or if it's stuck in the bone, you can pull it out using the feathers, but what if it's gone through the bone? and the arrow itself is stuck in the bone. So <laughs> I found a great illustration of what they used to do. 
So first of all, you mount a crossbow. Let me just move King David's head just in case he gets hurt. So you rig up a crossbow. This is great, isn't it? Make plenty of space. Now I can't actually do this for real because it would shoot a crossbow bolt straight through the ceiling of this room. So what I've done is I've put a, another string on, just an ordinary string, just to basically illustrate what they did, right? So here he is, hold on, let me take him off this. Right, so this crossbow now is locked with its false piece of string. Let me bring the patient in. Here he is again. So they would then attach the forceps to the arrowhead. Now I don't know if this is gonna work. I'll give it a go. But how about tying a piece of rope to the arrow, putting it through a pulley and tying it to the tail of a horse and then smacking the horse. Away it goes, out comes the arrow. Or a longbow, cross the top, drawing it, shooting the arrow through. This is from an actual drawing of the way you do it. This is a crossbow. Of course I can't use the main string because this will shoot the arrow through the house. So it's just a mock-up to show you. There is the patient, he's bracing himself, and you pull the trigger. And it actually works. Can you imagine the agony that they would have been through? But hey, it works. Field equipment, field surgery. But before my final demonstration, I must explain. Uh, my childhood hero was Robert the Bruce, without a doubt. And his son, David II of Scotland, was the king that was wounded badly at the Battle of Neville's Cross. Now I've done lots of research trying to find out, you know, where did the arrows hit him? But apparently he was hit twice in the face, may have had one in the leg as well. Now, if he's got two arrows in the face, he manages to fight on, he tries to make good his escape, but an English soldier spots his reflection as he's hiding under a bridge. And uh, as a knight goes to try and arrest him, this is a guy got two arrows in his face, punches the English knight, knocking out two teeth. He's captured and he is taken to Bamborough Castle where they try and remove the arrows. Now I'm gonna put the head down and show you the skull. So we don't know for sure where the arrows hit him. But we do know that one was easily removed. There we have the short bodkin. But the killer, or the, the nasty one, must have been somewhere around here. It's described as hitting him in the face. So I'm gonna take off the dome. Oh, there's a brain inside. So the arrow has gone through the cheekbone right the way to here somewhere in the middle of the head. As they're trying to remove the arrowhead using all of their old ways, they're wiggling it, they're trying to widen the wound. As they eventually pull it out, the end of it is missing. It's deep down in the face of David. He would suffer for the rest of his life with a piece of arrow stuck in his face. The more I read, the more fascinated I, I become of instances where leave the arrow in, yeah? Or, oh, the arrow popped out of its own accord. All the way through history, this problem, should we remove the arrow? Some of the early physicians says, leave it. Leave it to go septic, it'll soften, then we'll be able to pull the arrow out and then we can deal with the infection. One of them says, leave it long enough 
till the arrow begins to rot. Can you imagine the agony these men must have been in? Absolutely horrendous. But there again, they knew going into battle what the consequences could be, just like soldiers of today. The one thing that impresses me is that Hollywood has got it totally wrong. Men were taken from the battlefield. Men did have medical supplies and uh, they did repair them. Because let's face it, if you have an archer and it takes most of his life to train him, the last thing you want is for him to die from a wound. So they had the doctors and they did pretty well from what I can tell. Anyway, I'm sure Henry V, if he could talk about it, he'd tell you it saved his life. And uh, King David too, even with a bit of arrow stuck in his face, he lived a long time. So, medieval surgery, arrow removal, a lot more advanced than I think most people actually realise. Well, I hope you enjoyed our video with our little demonstrations. If you did, don't forget, like, share and subscribe. And don't forget to turn on the all notification button so you know what's coming down the line. And now a special shout out to some of my Patreon members. Hey guys, thanks a million for this. Jody Giacalone. Yeah, I hope I got that right. Jeff G and Joseph Sullivan. Hey guys, thanks a million. Bye for now.